the playoffs? <laughs> I think all the miracles, they, they cashed them in last year with the underdog mask and everything. No, I, I don't think legitimate. I don't see them going on the road. And Nick Foles, as a quarterback, he's played two good games in a row. Now, you know, one out of every four, he's got a dud coming out of there. So I don't believe them to be legitimate, even though they do have a strong run. They would almost assuredly, if they make it, be going to Chicago to face what I believe to be, and I think everyone believes to be the best defense in the NFC, if not in the entire NFL, them and the Ravens and the Bears. It, I don't know if Foles is better than Trubisky. I think it's probably very close right now. I know the Bears it, it, defense. You just saying that right there, you said a mouthful. Because I know you don't believe in Trubisky. I don't really believe in Trubisky. And so I, the, we haven't seen him in the playoffs. But I, So I will give the young quarterback the benefit of the doubt to a degree. But the Bears have been carried by their defense. It would be very surprising if they'd go on the road and beat Chicago. Rockets playing host to the Celtics last night. The Beard. Big game. James Harden went off 45 points, six assists, finishing nine of 18 from deep. Houston takes down Boston 127-113 for their eighth win in nine games. Nick, are the Rockets a contender if Harden can maintain this MVP form? Well, it, it, the form he's had over the last 10 games is unsustainable. It's the most points anyone has scored in a 10-game stretch in a decade in the NBA. But on the season, he's averaging 32 points, eight assists. He, I think, can sustain that, and that makes them one of the contenders along with Oklahoma City, the Lakers, and the Nuggets probably right beneath Golden State. So all of those teams need something disastrous to happen to Golden State, but the Rockets have moved themselves back into that tier of teams. They depend on Harden too much. I believe he is going to lead the league in scoring and assists, but man, he's got 48 more games to go and doing that on his legs. I believe his legs will suffer in a seven-game series a lot like they did the last couple years. All right, let's end with the LeBron-less Lakers taking on the Kings. The actual King missing his first game with a groin injury. Lakers could have used him late. They blew a 15-point fourth quarter lead. Sacramento beating the Lakers 117-116. All right, Nick, what did we learn about the Lakers without LeBron in there? Well, for 42 minutes of this game, you had to be incredibly encouraged. They were run. They didn't fall apart the way so many LeBron teams fall apart when he's out there because he is the offense you run when you have LeBron is a LeBron James offense, and they seem to have and credit to Luke Walton another offense ready to go. His ball movement, Lonzo played very well. Kuzma was outstanding. So all those things are, are quality marks in the right direction. The negative is they couldn't close and they fell apart down the stretch in a winnable game that will matter. It's not just the Ingram free throw at the end that made it a two-point lead instead of a three-point lead. So that ended up being the game-winning three. But it was Ingram, I would argue, throughout the entire second half. He had 19 points with eight minutes left in the third quarter. He finished with 22. So there are some positives to take away from it. Lonzo and Kuzma, most notably, along with Luke Walton. Ingram and the finish are the negatives and the things that make you feel like they're going to really miss LeBron in this extended stretch. Yeah, it's hard to learn a lot when you have three of, say, your front seven players not playing. Rondo didn't play. JaVale McGee, he's still out um, with his bout with pneumonia and, of course, LeBron being out. You talk about the big lead that they've had. They've had bigger leads um, in games this year. They weren't able to close out either. Now, we know LeBron, as Luke Walton said, after the game, we have the number one closer. So I believe if he's out there, it's going to be different. But these younger players are developing. And to me, what I saw is their overall confidence playing together. Nick, you mentioned before, they had five guys all drafted by the Lakers starting in the lineup in yep. the last uh, three years in the starting lineup. I believe that's very, very encouraging. And the game plan that Luke Walton came up with, they embraced that. That, to me, means they believe in him. Younger players are developing. So for me, in, in the half-court situation, are they running things? Is Luke Walton putting them in winning situations? Yes. Are these younger players continue to develop. Yes, those are all feathers into the cap of Luke Walton as he continues to try to cut his teeth being an NBA coach. And it's looking more and more like they've got a number two for LeBron right now. Not the all-star number two he's used to, but a number two for LeBron right now. It's just not the guy most people thought he was going to be going into the year. It's not Brandon Ingram. It's Kyle Kuzma, who has been far and away the best Laker, uh, the best wing Laker not named LeBron James. All right, moving on to a big weekend in college football with the playoff semifinals on Saturday, Alabama taking on Oklahoma in the Orange Bowl while Clemson squares off with Notre Dame in the Cotton Bowl. And who better to talk about it than Fox College football analyst Joel Clad? Good morning, Joel. Good morning. How are you guys? We are great. Thanks for hanging out with us today. So let's start and dive right in with the first game with Alabama two score favorites in the college football playoff semifinal. What do 
Kyle Murray and the Sooners have to do to pull off this upset? Yeah, so I, I scoured all the, the statistics and watched a lot of film on these games to try to figure out wh what are the ways that Notre Dame or Oklahoma, in this case Oklahoma, what are the ways that they can keep these games close or even pull off the upsets against the heavily favored Clemson Tigers and Alabama uh, 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 Crimson Tide. Here's what I came up with for, for how to beat Alabama. Virtually nothing. <laughs> Here's the hard part is when you go back through and you look at the games in which teams have actually beaten Alabama, if you take out Ole Miss's game in which Alabama turned the ball over five times and, and Bama was a minus five in the turnover margin, there's really only one constant, and that constant is the fact that offenses have gone out there and snapped the ball over 75 times, and they've worn out the Alabama defense to the tune of over 14, 17 points in the second half. I think that's the way that Oklahoma needs to do this. It would help if they got some turnovers from that porous defense. It would obviously help if they continued to be the most explosive offense in all of college football with, with more 50-plus yard plays than anybody uh, in America. But for me, it's more about the number of plays. Remember a couple of years ago, Deshaun Watson and the Clemson Tigers, they ultimately beat a very strong Alabama team. And the reason that they did that is because they snapped the ball 99 times. I think if Oklahoma goes over 85 snaps, that's going to be the ultimate blueprint, blueprint for them to be close and potentially within a possession late in the game. All right, the thing that's differentiated this great Alabama team from the other great Alabama teams, of course, their quarterback. Heisman yeah. runner up to a tongue of Iloa. He said he's about 80 to 85 percent healthy. I, I don't know if we're going to take him at his word on that or not, but how do you think the Alabama game plan changes with a potentially hampered Tua? I don't think it changes at all because I don't think that they have to cater to Tua. Now, they're best when he's out there, um, Nick, but I, I think that they could probably beat Oklahoma if Jalen Hurts started and played the entire game. That's how dominant I think this Alabama team is because they still have got a great running game. Remember, they got two backs that are close to 1,000 yards, averaging over six yards per carry. They're pretty good up front. They've got one of the deeper and, and uh, more sound wide receiver cores in all of college football. They're explosive on the outside. Uh, I don't think that they have to have Tua. Now, him being in the lineup obviously makes them the best that they possibly could be. What I'm nervous for about uh, this passing game, if Tua is out there, regardless of if he's 80%, 85%, 90%, if you look at the worst defenses that he's played during the course of the season, he has absolutely torched them, which you would expect from a player of his caliber. But the top three defenses that he faced, as far as statistics go, he was four touchdowns, four interceptions. The bottom 10 defense defenses, 33 touchdowns, zero interceptions, and Oklahoma is dead last in passing defense in the entire country. Dead last. That makes me extremely nervous. Whether Tua Tungavailoa is at 70% or 80% or 90%, they're ultimately going to be able to throw the ball pretty successfully against the Sooners D. Joel, let's move over to the other college football semifinals. Clemson coming in, huge favorite against the fighting Irish in the Cotton Bowl. At the end of the game, if Irish fans are happy and celebrating with a cocktail, what has happened for them to pull off the huge upset over the Tigers? Yeah, I think it's going to be a huge day from Ian Book. And obviously, you know, a quarterback's going to have to play well to beat Clemson. But look at where Clemson has struggled at times. And there's really one area. CC, it's pass defense. If you go back to their game against Texas A&M, Kellen Mond threw for over 400 yards in that game. A&M almost pulled off that upset early in the season. Then late in the season against South Carolina, a game that Clemson ultimately controlled on the offensive side because South Carolina could not play any defense. But Jake Bentley from South Carolina threw for over 500 yards. There are some holes in the secondary for Clemson, and if you're looking at a way that Notre Dame can keep this game close, ultimately maybe have a lead in the third quarter, even early in the fourth quarter, I think it's their ability to throw the football. Now, they're a balanced team, but their ability to throw it with Ian Book has been uh, markedly better than what they were last year and early this season under Brandon Wimbush. So that's where I would look to. I think it's Ian Book and his ability to be efficient, and explosive in the passing game that ultimately would keep Notre Dame close if they are close late in this game. All right, Joel, let's talk about the experience variable here. This is Notre Dame's first college football playoff for Clemson, their fourth straight trip to the Final Four. How much does experience factor into this Cotton Bowl matchup? I mean, you would always w want more experience, right? I think football is a reps sport. Now, having said that, I, I don't know how 
that plays out when it comes to college players because we haven't seen teams go through playoffs. I mean, this is only, what, the fifth year of the college football playoff. Granted, Clemson's been here a bunch. They went out and laid an egg last year in their semifinal game. Granted, it was against Alabama. Um, I think they're going to play well. Their quarterback's a true freshman. He doesn't have experience in this game. Their coaching staff does. I think Brent Venables is going to learn a lot about what he needs to do, in particular in the pass defense after the long break, um, after playing South Carolina. Uh, but it, it, it remains to be seen for me, Jenna, experience in college football is, is so elusive because of the quick cycle. Because like I said, the team, you could say, has been there for four straight years, and yet they're quarterback is a true freshman so how experienced are they really you know I, I'm not sure Oregon quarterback Justin Herbert to move off the college football playoff for a moment is going to come back for his senior season I think he was yeah. most people's projected first quarterback off the board in the upcoming draft and I know that can change what do you what did you make of his decision were you surprised by it what was your reaction I was a little bit surprised. I think that any time that you're projected to be in the top 10, you're looking at quite a payday. I mean, you know, uh, you look at last year's quarterbacks and, and all the quarterbacks all the way down to even outside of the top 10 when you're looking at Josh Rosen and Arizona, uh, Arizona, they signed contracts north of $15 million. Uh, the two guys in the top five were north of $30 million. I think that's tough to turn down. Um, they have something going, though, in Eugene right now. Nick, they pulled off a top five recruiting class. Then they get Herbert to stay. Uh, his younger brother's coming in. He's going to be a, kind of a wide receiver, tight end type of player for them. Maybe that was a factor. But ultimately, remember now, we always point at the dollars and cents, and that's clearly the way that we can evaluate it. But college is a special time, and there are some guys that just love being a college player. And they love trying to build something and leave a legacy, which he's trying to do at Oregon. I spoke with, with Matt Leinert a lot about this. He said he was trying to leave a legacy at USC, which he thinks he did, even though they <laughs> didn't pull off that national championship his last year. Guys have stayed, and this has worked out for him. Guys have stayed, and it hasn't worked out for him. Um, for me, it's an individual decision, but it's awfully hard to turn down north of $17 million. That's generational <laughs> money. Uh, that he's turning down right now, and hopefully he's going to stay healthy, have a good year, and get right back into that po uh, position next season. With Herbert staying in school, the draft class now is switched up, but not now. The focus will be on Buckeyes quarterback yep. Dwayne Haskins. Do you feel like Haskins? Because you, if you feel like money's a part of it, the college experience is a part. What's a greater college experience than being a quarterback of Ohio State and being a captain coming back under Ryan Day as the new head coach? So how much pressure do you think is on Haskins to be able to make that decision to stay in college? That's a great question. And and I think if if so, if I were these two, I would understand Herbert staying at Oregon for Mario Cristobal and, and that top five recruiting class. While, CC, this is, might not be what you want to hear, I would understand if Haskins came out. First of all, now all of a sudden, he's going to be likely the top prospect. So now he's looking at somewhere north of $30 million in the top five. He's going to have a brand new head coach. He's losing a, a, a ton of wide receiver talent on the outside because th that was a veteran, senior-laden, captain-oriented wide receiver group on the outside that was terrific for him all season long. Um, I think I would leave if I was Dwayne Haskins because he played some of the best football that I have ever seen in those last three games. What he did against Michigan was incredible. The way he played against Northwestern late in that ball game was incredible uh, in, in the Big Ten Championship. And I think he could capitalize on that. I would have never said that he was a top 10 or top 5 pick during the course of the season until the last few games. So all of a sudden, CC, his value has never been higher. And I'm talking about 30 plus million dollars. I know I just said it's individual and it's all about the college experience and all that. And I understand. I don't want to criticize Herbert for not coming out. But I, I would recommend whether it's Herbert or Haskins that they were to come out. Uh, the reason is, is that this draft class is not that strong from a quarterback perspective. He's likely to be a top five pick. And I don't know if I won't, would want to go through all that coaching change and, and, and rebuilding with the wide receiver core that he's going to have to do next season. Joel, thank you so much. Always great insight. Appreciate you getting up with us today. Absolutely. Happy holidays, guys.